rocking the mullet look. Just got some news to tell you. I've just spotted something pretty exciting out here. So open the window and give you a look. You see it? You work it out? It's a wild dream cast. It's amazing. It's just simply amazing. There have always been games that shouldn't have been able to be ported to other machines, but they've always happened and they've often impressed. On the Game Boy Advance, the number of impressive ports, I would argue, was lower. But the sheer girthiness of how much it did impress was absolutely girthy. I have official measurements here and the girth is off the charts, frankly. Nintendo's handheld might have ended up being viewed a lot of the time as a snares you carry in your pocket, but the truth was it was a capable little machine for the time. Not hugely powerful, but home to potential, often left untapped when handling its usual batch of updated ports from the snares or crappy platformers nobody cared about. Sometimes, though, developers found it in themselves to, well, try a bit harder, to push a bit further, to pump out impossible ports. And here's a few of them I wanted to look at. First, it's fair to touch on those already mentioned in my previous Impossible Ports video. You've got Driver 3, which was a terrible game, but a frankly ludicrous technical achievement on GBA. You've got Doom or Doom 2, which showed pretty easily that the GBA was much more than just a handheld SNES. And you've got V-Rally 3, which I wish had been a lot more fun to play because it looked amazing and, for my money, shat all over the GBA version of Need for Speed Underground 2. On we go, though. Not much of a surprise that the developer of Doom 2 on GBA was the same one as for Duke Nukem Advance, so I'll go with the ever so slightly more shocking news that Taurus Games port wasn't really a port. Duke's Advance outing was actually an original game. But if Duke Nukem 3D didn't exist, it wouldn't have happened, so I'm counting it and you cannot stop me. It's a great way to start this list. And honestly, it has to be included here because Duke Advance was genuinely impressive. It ran smoothly, and while shrunken down to the postage stamp screen of the GBA, it maintained a hell of a lot of the feel of Duke 3D's outing on the PC. Sound-wise, it was fantastic. Well, as fantastic as something could sound through the handheld's super fun time speakers. It had multiplayer, it even controlled pretty well, maintaining the ability to look up and down, switching out weapons, interacting, strafing, whatever. It was just well done, to the point you'd forget you were playing it on a teeny tiny little handheld. Such a big leap from home computer to GBA, but so little of the actual feel of the thing was lost in Duke Nukem Advance. Great stuff. The GBA launched with some brilliant games. Super Mario Advance, F-Zero Maximum Velocity, Fire Pro Wrestling, uh, Tweety and the Magic Jewel, not that one. But it also launched with a game that, right from the go, showed what developers paying attention to their craft would be able to pull off. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 was one of the smartest ports I'd ever seen, I still have ever seen, and set the stage for how almost all Birdman games would be through the GBA's lifespan. It's clumsy now, I have to admit, and I struggle to play it properly because that perspective just nadges up my depth perception, but that's not the point. What is the point is that Vicarious or Vicarious Visions was able to squeeze the distilled essence of the Tony Hawk series out and repackage it as an isometric trick -em up that maintained the excitement and challenge of the original game, bringing with it the tricks, skaters and stages from the PS1 game, and moulding it all wonderfully into a far more limited system. Okay, so it lost the soundtrack, a deal breaker for some I'm sure, but practically everything else that made Thork 2 great somehow, some way, made the leap to GBA. And things continued down this path for most of the series mainline releases on GBA through to Tony Hawk's Underground 2. It was a bit more ambitious by this point and honestly it suffered as a result, but it was no less impressive that the run of ridiculously good ports continued this long. I'm always going to stick with the PS1 originals, and last year's superb remaster of course, but Tony Hawk's 2 was a true Game Boy Advance original impossible port. Another one of a few examples on this very list where developers knew they wanted to transpose a game to the GBA, but were also very much aware of the limitations of the target platform. Tekken Advance didn't bother trying to ape Tekken 3 perfectly. That would have been its death now. No, Namco instead modified things to make a game that would suit the platform, while at the same time maintaining that all-important, uh, gusto? Chutzpah. Mouthfeel. Whatever it is, it was there. 
Like Virtua Fighter on the Mega Drive, Tekken Advance moved things from 3D to 2D in order to keep a lid on, well, performance. If it had tried to be like the arcade game, even the PS1 game, Tekken's handheld adventure would have been a ropey one at best. Instead, what we got was a game that grabbed you by the butt cheeks from the very first second. A more than competent fighting game that, while not quite at the level of its more accomplished original versions, was a damn fun fighting game to have a pop at. It even included sidestepping, thus making it actually a 3D fighting game. I mean, not really, but it, it sort of did. Tekken Advance nailed the form for the GBA and as such, the function followed. A solidly lovely port. Well, original game that's basically a port. Again, lots of those around. Hmm. An ambitious undertaking from Italian studio Ray Light um, studios, what Wing Commander Prophecy lacked in FMV sequences with high-impact actors such as Luke Skywalker when he had nothing better to do with his time in the 90s, and the guy who played Biff Tannen, who I don't like because he turned down an interview request I sent him once, mistakenly assuming I wanted to talk to him about Back to the Future when actually I wanted to talk to him about, well, Wing Commander, but hey, sidetracked. Prophecy on GBA lost the FMV sequences, and really it lost a lot of the actual interesting elements of a good space combat game because it was as dull as they get. It controlled poorly, combat was twitchy and just plain uninteresting. It, 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 it wasn't a very good game, in short. But oh boy, what a technical feat. Full 3D ships flitting about the battlefield at high speeds, blasting each other out of the stars, and with the odd bit of digitised speech thrown in to remind you that your comrades were being just as murdered as the alien beasties you were fighting. As a game it kinda sucked, but as an example of what could be done on GBA, Wing Commander Prophecy slapped. Special mention to Raylight's also ambitious effort to get Resident Evil 2 onto the GBA. It made up this tech demo to pitch the project but was turned down by a Capcom that had moved on from the handheld as a viable machine. Leon's running animation was weird as all heck but the overall effect of this little demo was bloody impressive. Okay, so the game was garbage and not actually a particularly good port of Serious Sam's original PC exploits, as with Duke Nukem Advance it was more of its own thing based heavily on the original. It was also poorly optimised, loose of controls and generally a bit of a slog through samey dull action, but it was still an impossible port because it was Serious Sam on a Game Boy Advance. Or at least it was as close an approximation of Serious Sam on Game Boy Advance as you could have hoped for. The original game was made to slap PCs upside the head and teach them who was boss, a proto-crisis in a way, so for the game to make the leap to handheld device was daft. And it didn't work overall. It shouldn't have come to GBA. But it had big open arenas for encounters against dozens of enemies, not all at the same time of course, and generally did far better at recreating Serious Sam than might have been expected. It seemed impossible a game like this would make it to the GBA in as close an approximation of the original's form as it managed. So in that respect Serious Sam Advance was an impossible port. But it was also a bad game with myriad technical issues. Haha, <laughs> life's great, grand, fantastic grey areas. Another third-person 3D game given the isometric treatment, Max Payne might have made a big leap in its visual presentation, but its jump to Game Boy Advance didn't see the actual content of the game change very much. It was, it still is, a surprise just how close to the Gurning Madman's original adventure in gun worship the handheld version manages to be, even if the overall package isn't quite there when it comes to, you know, fun and that. Some levels were omitted, some of the voiceover stuff went bye-bye, but largely Max Payne was the maximum amount of pain you could have hoped for from the limited format. And note I said some of the voiceover was out the door. That's because a lot of it, in the graphic novel cutscenes at least, made the jump. No! Compressed as all who heckery sure, but they're there, and they're as overwritten and gruff as you remembered from the original if you played it. If you didn't play it, you'd probably have no idea, but you get the idea from me saying words here. I'm nice to you like that. Most importantly though was that feel, and Max Payne GBA absolutely nailed the feel of the thing. Bullet time felt like bullet time. The mood of the thing was spot on. The violence was that mix of satisfying and silly. The blood spattering about as you dive into a room full of hench idiots with the sound warping and slowing, before you finish a level and get a gurning finish man enduring sad and bad things happening. Yeah, that was Max Payne. And it was unexpected, nay impossible, to expect that 
on GBA. Mobius Entertainment's performance making Max Payne resulted in the team joining the Rockstar Empire not long after the game's release. After being rebranded as Rockstar Leeds, Mighty Mighty Leeds, the studio went on to make GTA Liberty and Vice City Stories, as well as Chinatown Wars, all handheld classics in their own right and, in the case of the former two, a couple more contenders for impossible ports. Not a bad run, you have to say. Our old friends from Driver 3 and V-Rally 3, Velez and Dubail, managed to make yet another ludicrously impressive port on the GBA's limited hardware. How the team managed to get a 3D platformer running, and running well, on a platform with such a lack of grunt is completely beyond me. It looked fantastic for a GBA game, ran smoothly, and managed to be just as wow-worthy as the twosome's other two games that got mentioned in that previous list. Admittedly, it was a toilet of a game, but you can't have everything. It's worth adding some context here. When Broken Sword released on the Game Boy Advance, adventure games on handheld, well, they just didn't really happen. A handful of times, maybe. I remember it being a genuine revelation when I was able to get Scum VM, or should that be S-C-U-M-M-V-M, -M -M, running on my PSP in order to play Monkey Island, and that was some time later than Broken Sword's GBA release, so it's safe to say that seeing a point-and-click game on a handheld was a huge rarity. So to see a point-and-click game ported from its gorgeous original PC form onto GBA and somehow retaining most of what made it stand out from the crowd, well, that was just an impossibility. As you'd expect if you've been paying attention in the cheap seats, Broken Sword was cut back on GBA. No way could it have featured the rich, detailed sprite work of the PC original, nor could it have fit in the lush cutscenes or the fully voiced dialogue, so that was out. But there was still a genuine impression made by the game, which came to be, by the developer's own account, as a result of a mad suggestion. Sprites and backgrounds were less detailed, sure, but they were still mightily impressive. Compressed with care and converted to the small screen without losing what made them unique. Controls were modified to perfectly suit the handheld, with direct control and the ability to highlight points of interest making it less of a pixel hunting slog. And beyond that, Broken Sword on the GBA featured every mystery, puzzle, situation and location of the original game, all shrunk down with that due care and attention I love so much. There was no way a point-and-click adventure game could be this good on Game Boy Advance, not a port of a PC classic. No way. Yet there we were in 2002, having our socks collectively knocked off. There's an argument to be made that Street Fighter Alpha 3 Upper is THE perfect port. No, it wasn't exactly the same as the arcade version, nor was it anything like the Saturn version, even the PlayStation version. It was compressed, more slight in presentation. At a glance, it looked like less than the original from which it came. But pick away a bit, rub the flecks of judgmental filth out of your eyes, and you realise that actually Crawfish put together an incredible port of a game that just shouldn't have been this good on GBA. So yes, missing backgrounds and music, you'd have expected that. Smaller sprites? Sure. Some voice samples AWOL? Yeah, but also 38 characters. Not just every character from the original Street Fighter Alpha 3, but additional ones on top of that, including Eagle, Mackie and Yun, three who to that point hadn't actually been in any other version of Alpha 3 on any format. Cut down mechanics to help facilitate it all though, surely. No, Upper saw all three fighting styles, V-ism, A-ism, J-ism, whatever they're called, all the combos and specials and supers and whatever else you could hope for, and, very importantly, it all controlled incredibly well. Sure, the GBA's four buttons were limiting for a six-button fighter, but toggles for medium hits were easy enough to get used to, and really it didn't impact the flow in any significant way once you were over that small first hurdle. It didn't quite look the part, but it had its own distinct character. It also had every distinct character from Alpha 3 plus a few more. Dramatic Battle made the cut somehow, as did a few other extra modes, and it played absolutely wonderfully. Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo Revival released a year prior and was very good, but Street Fighter Alpha 3 Upper was, fittingly for the name, a cut above. Because above. Upper. Upper. It's a great pun. Cheers for watching. I still never played any of these games anywhere near as much as either Final Fantasy Tactics Advance or Harvest Moon Friends and Mineral Town, but hey. Bye!